Dr. Eric Kelly III, and a host of phenomenal speakers from all around the globe for this seven-day virtual event that you don't want to miss. The mission of the Black Business Expo is to raise scholarship money from kids all the way from high school all the way from college. The Black Business Olympics is one of the largest black business showcases in the world. It is an opportunity for businesses and companies to showcase their businesses globally. We are going to be giving away laptops up to $5,000 away to students. Again, I'm Olivia Appleberry, the founder of Two Cents Finance and one of the speakers for the expo. I am so excited to see you there. For more info, go to www.blackbusinessexpousa.com or call 919-308-9090 and hope to see you there. I am Black Business. From the moment I wake until the time I sleep. Yes, I am black business. I am black business. Tell me, are you black business? I am black business. Do you support black businesses? Listen, I support black business because I am black business. Black Business Expo. One of the largest business showcases in the history of black business in the world. The world. Sign up today at www.blackbusinessexpousa.com or call 919-308-9090. I am black business.
Dr. Eric Kelly III and a host of phenomenal speakers from all around the globe for this seven-day virtual event that you don't want to miss. The mission of the Black Business Expo is to raise scholarship money from kids all the way from high school all the way from college. The Black Business Olympics is one of the largest black business showcases in the world. It is an opportunity for businesses and companies to showcase their businesses globally. We are going to be giving away laptops up to $5,000 away to students. Again, I'm Olivia Appleberry, the founder of Two Cents Finance and one of the speakers for the expo. I am so excited to see you there. For more info, go to www.blackbusinessexpousa.com or call 919-308-9090 and hope to see you there. I am Black Business. From the moment I wake until the time I sleep. Yes, I am black business. I am black business. Tell me, are you black business? I am black business. Do you support black businesses? Listen, I support black business because I am black business. Black Business Expo. One of the largest business showcases in the history of black business in the world. Hello, 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 everyone. Good afternoon. Business owners, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and corporations, welcome to the Black Business Network. My name is Grant McGaw, CEO of Five Star BDM, where we help you to build a five-star brand that people will follow. I'm your business moderator for this afternoon on the Black Business Network. The Black Business Network is a 24-hour business network showcasing Black businesses, business owners, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders worldwide. We have speakers from North Carolina, London, Singapore, Africa, Japan, and cities all over the United States. The Black Business Network is a global community sharing its business knowledge to empower, inspire, and educate businesses about business. Our next speakers are Dr. Alexis Portero Weeks and Dr. Tina Honey. Dr. Alexis Portero Weeks is a data privacy champion who believes that everyone should own, control, and determine the way their protected information is processed. A senior global data protection and cybersecurity risk leader with over 20 years of proven experience in the information technology, risk management, data protection, audit, and governance. We also have Dr. Tina Honey, currently works as an information security risk and compliance analyst. She co-founded CyberMinds Research Institute, LLC, a nonprofit research think tank. She also sits on the IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board for CyberMinds Research Institute. She serves on the Academic Advisory Committee for CyberCubics, LLC, a cybersecurity professional certificate, certificate program and is a research fellow for the America's Institute for Cybersecurity Leadership, a think tank focused on cybersecurity discourse relevant to North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. I present to you, Alexis and Tina. Thank you, Grant. How are you, sir? I'm doing just fine. So good to see you. And there she is. Hello. How are you doing, Dr. Tina? All right. All right. We're going to have a great discussion. I'm going to be the moderator for this discussion as we're going to have a fireside chat and talk about some things that are very, very important in today's business, especially when you are using digital technologies. And that's around cyber security. So I'm going to first ask a question. We're going to have a round, just open discussion 
around cybersecurity because there are some misunderstandings uh, about it. There's a lot of you know fear, angst, anxiety out there around cybersecurity. So we're going to start with a just a just a basic question about what are some of the biggest cybersecurity threats facing businesses today. So. I think some of the biggest risks facing business today from a cybersecurity is just trying to understand what they have, what information they have and as, as an organization. I, I, you, you can't protect what you don't know you have, right? So you need to be able to know what you have. So that becomes a risk. I think the biggest risk today in, in, a, in 2023 is just from organization who think that they're not going to be impacted by an incident. Right, it's not going to happen to me. It's going to happen to the next party, but not that's definitely not my organization. I think that's a big misnomer that exists in the market today. That's interesting. What would you say, Doctor Tina? Uh, I would also pretty much say the same thing, but a lot of companies also is from the leadership perspective, right? Because just like Doctor Week said, <clears throat> it's always uh, it's not going to be us. So a lot of times, leaders will get consultation and they'll get advice of what they should put in place to be safe, but they ignore that until they're breached. And then, of course, now they got to spend all the money to try to, you know, their reputation, the financial loss and everything like that. Had they just listened to the advice that they received, they wouldn't necessarily be in that kind of situation. And it's not about, as Dr. Week says, it's not about if you're going to be breached, it's when. And then how are you prepared to move forward from there? Wow, that's that's something to say loud and clear. It's not if you're going to be breached, it is when. And it becomes an entanglement when you are breached because it's, just, it's hard to get through all that. So you should invest in cybersecurity tools to help mitigate these problems. But before we talk about the tools, I know there was one thing that um, I've learned is that cybersecurity is not a IT issue. It's a enterprise compliance and risk issue. Dr. Pertero Weeks, can you talk about that? So I, I think when you have to kind of separate cybersecurity from an IT function itself, I think that's one of the challenges when we start looking at a reporting structure. Like the individual who is responsible for the cybersecurity program have to be able to look at the risk across the entire enterprise, like you said, Glenn. So being able to separate that individual from the IT function, from even from a reporting perspective, is beneficial to the organization. Because there is always that expectation in terms of conflict, right? What if you now need to IT uh, audit the CIO function for which we may have a direct report, right? They may represent a conflict there. And being able to step out of that centralized role, allow him to have a broader perspective at the enterprise level to be able to set guidance and strategy for the entire organization because cybersecurity is not just a risk from an IT system. There are many parts of the organization where they may risk. There may be financial risk, there may be reputational risk, there may be legal risk. So that individual have to be able to have a broad or holistic approach from an organization perspective to be able to be successful in their execution of tasks. Interesting, interesting. Any input there, Dr. Honey? Sure, of course, um, you know, most companies, they focus on tools. We always talk about tools, 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 tools to to, you know, to keep us safe. But the biggest the the biggest weakest link is humans. It doesn't matter how many tools we have in place. If the human is still going to uh, purposely click the wrong button or inadvertently click the wrong button, accept the link. Um, you know, we all get these emails and there's links and you didn't expect to get a link and people don't pay attention and they just click it. And now you have opened up the company or opened up your, your personal information to a potential breach. So humans are the weakest link. This is that. And, and you're right. I, I, I think today, I think probably on a daily basis, I, I see at least three phishing emails that, that, that come up. I mean, it's just there. I want to ask Dr. Tina, because there's a couple of things I want to ask you. Number one, you are an African-American female in a space dominated really by, by white males, and you're, you're doing a great job. So talk to me first about how you feel and how you navigate this world in cybersecurity yourself, and then talk to us a little bit more about these phishing email attacks. 
Well, uh, like Dr. Weeks, I have over 20 plus years of experience in the IT industry. I started off, um, you know, in computer science. I went to Morris Brown College, HBCU. So, um, you know, I'm accustomed to being in this field dominated by men. Um, and so you just get a, you just get used to it. Um, it's not something we probably should get used to, but you get used to it because 20 plus years and they haven't changed and I'm not seeing it right now changing. Although I am part, I'm an adjunct professor, <clears throat> excuse me, at Miami Day College. And I constantly support women or young ladies in this field. So I'm constantly pushing and mentoring and talking to young ladies to try to get in this field. Um, Dr. Weeks and I, we're always talking about how we can reach back, even back to elementary school and try to support, because we have to go back there and support and get young ladies and young women involved instead of waiting to high school or college. It's too late. So we have to start sooner rather than yeah. later. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad you started sooner. <laughs> exactly. And then the other conversation you, you asked about the fishing. So, yeah, I mean, when companies don't send or don't, I would say, send their employees through training on a regular basis to get accustomed to what type of phishing emails that they may receive. And if companies don't send them to training and and they don't do often practice training, you know, just send a practice phishing email every now and then, you know, every couple of months or every month, then you, the employee won't get used to it. And then they'll be accustomed to clicking on the stuff. The same thing when you're at home, if you take that same security thought process that you practice at home and take it to work and, and you practice it at work and take it back home, then you'll be more safe in both areas because you're constantly have it on your mind. But when you don't practice it, is how people get caught up. Or you look at something too fast because we've all done it. We, you know, even as security experts that we say, hey, don't don't do this, don't click this button. And we all do it. We look at something, we did something too fast, and we're like, oh crap. So it's it's not that you know, just because we're experts, we don't do it. We fall into it as well. We just have to keep it conscious every single day when you're looking at emails. Interesting. Dr. Pertero Weeks, would you like to say, would you like to chime in on this? Oh, definitely. I think Dr. Honey was on point there. Um, business email compromise is one of the fastest going attacks that businesses are experiencing today. And I think one of the things, like, like Dr. Honey said, if you as an organization is going to depend on the end user to not click that link, they will click that link, right? So as an organization, you have to be, you, you have to be thinking ahead of that, right? You cannot just leave the decision to the end user because by default, they will click that link. So you need to have controls in place that would assess that email before it even get to the end user, right? Mm -hmm. By being able to put processes in place where that is inspected as it enter your organization or even before it enter your organization to be able to address that. Um, reducing the ability for click through by suppressing links in the email, maybe wanting to be able to look at. And as, as, as Dr. Honey said, because individuals have this fast-paced environment for which we are moving, organizations tend to, I would say, borrow money, right? You know, they lost $300,000 because effective controls was not in place because a perpetrator was inside your network, updated, routing information, and there's no second step validation around that stuff. So the whole issue, I think Dr. Honey addressed the concern about the individual being the weakest link, I think many organizations think they're going to solution themselves out of the problem, right? New toys, new solution is not going to address that because most organizations, if you could look at it from a research perspective right now, an incident may occur and most of the time it's anywhere between 12 months to 18 months before you even detect that someone is in your network, wow. right? So because they're coming in and they're doing re reconnaissance and looking at how processes are working, They've had enough time to build out how the process flows, who have access to what, and being able to better target you as an organization. And if you look at it from a research perspective now, most organizations are not able to go and make that argument to the board about needing that investment. As an industry, we continue to be more reactive. After an investment, after an incident occur, you know, that $5 million become available. 
But when you try to go and have that conversation with the board ahead of time, they're not able to justify that spend because everyone thinks they're not going to get hit until they really get hit. Yeah. And then afterwards, we become more reactive to that situation of now going in and making that investment that we should have done at the onset. Interesting, interesting knowledge that you're sharing there. And we've got these new things. Now, you, people hear about this thing. They don't really know what they are. I want to ask you, and let's see both of you, about bots. People say bots. What is the bots? They got AI bots. They got all these bots. It's like, how do, how do you defend against these bots, uh, this, this automation that's happening? So, you know, you know bots is not a new form, phenomenon. I think one of the things that we have seen with the uptake of bots there's almost a bot that can do everything, right? Um, I think one of the speakers was talking yesterday and when we, we had our session, he was talking about having a bot join to be able to take notes from him, right? <laughs> now we as human have to go onto the website and validate through a bot that we are not a bot, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so when you consider that, those are the kind of uh, challenges that we are facing from an from a uptick of bots. I think we've seen an uptick in, in situation where people are executing a lot more tasks through automation, right? So because we're trying to automate more stuff, there's an exposure to determine, okay, is it a real person making that decision? If you look at it from network attacks, the ability for a bot to command and control millions of the devices to be able to come and attack your network is some of the challenges in terms of how you'll be able to do that. I think from a technology development perspective, we're trying to develop ways to decipher, is it a real person? And you're seeing a lot more of that when you go to certain sites that you're filling out forms, you know, they make sure your tasks that it would have to be somebody there to see it. You know, two plus two, you know, or whatever number that they may show you, you need to be able to validate that. Interesting. What would you say to that, Dr. Honey? I was going to say, but bots are going to continue to become more intelligent. And so... Uh, we're going to get past the, is this a human? And we have to check the box because we have artificial intelligence <laughs> and we're, we're, they're going to get smart enough where they're going to be, be able to give the answer was two plus two. They're going to be able to check, you know, where all oh, these are the bridges or check all the boxes where there's cars. So, you know, we all have to just continue to uh, innovate because the bots are going to continue to get smarter and smarter. You know, this is where we are with AI intelligence. This is interesting. I want to talk about cyber warfare. I mean, you hear about these things. They, they call them uh, unfriendly uh, uh, government states or, 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 you know, something to that effect. And, you know, a lot of this stuff you hear, they're, they're coming out of Russia. They used to come out of, you know, China. They're coming out of these other locations, pretending to be whatever, whatever. But these are nation states that are purposely targeting uh, U.S. citizens and others you know, uh, as a tactic, talk to us about what is cyber warfare and what, what can what can we do about that? So, you know, cyber warfare is something that's always, you know, warfare is something that's always been there, you know, from an intelligence perspective. I think one of the things when you look at it from cyber warfare, I think we are now in an environment where we overshare too much, right? So people who have trade secrets and had high enough credential level need to be mindful of what they do online, what information is shared and what information they're sharing with individuals that's not at the level to have that information. I think from a nation states, the nation states are making as much investments as we are, right, from a technology perspective. And their goal is to be able to exfiltrate or infiltrate our, our architecture and learn our trade secrets. So, you know, for us, we have to be doing a lot of the hygiene that is required. If you're working on highly classified stuff, you've seen it all the time. You know, Tina talked about the whole issue of the, the user being the weak link. Anyone who have access to privileged information or any organization that's doing sophisticated development have to be mindful of cybersecurity risk. And you can't let your guard down at any one time, right? If you're going to come up with a new F-16 jet, Next week, they're probably going to know if somebody's careless because you're spinning up infrastructure that's just left open, right? Um, one of the things that I see today, I think we have this click, click, next syndrome where everything is so easy to automate and being able to move to the cloud that anyone thinks they can do it, right? They have never managed it at the infrastructure before it now go to the cloud and all of a sudden they're now an expert. So from a from a warfare perspective, that becomes a tool in terms of another battleground that we're going to see in the future, where developed nation and some nation that has not developed 
are able to deploy asset to bring down infrastructure. I think some of the presidential um, executive legislation we've seen over the last couple of years have specifically addressed that, right? Because now you're going into war and the adversary can now come after your critical infrastructure. If you're still running that um, Windows 7 box, running your, your water treatment plan, you're going to get compromised, right? Yeah. So you got to be able to strategically fight war from miles away, but still also protect the home front. Interesting. Dr. Honey, you got any thoughts around that? No, uh, you know, again, things are going to move faster and we have to move faster. We have to move, um, you know, a lot of times, especially with the government, they don't move as fast as we like them to. Laws and, and policies and rules and regulations don't move as fast as we like them to, but um, everything is going to have to pick up faster if we want to keep up and be able to be in the fight. I didn't say win the fight. I said be in the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. I mean, this is a lot of our audience probably even know, either have heard it, but they don't really know what this is. This dark web is a dark web. It's like this web out there where criminals can go to is the criminal internet and that you can like download it. But you know what? I'm going to download uh, ransomware and I'll just deploy it, you know, and you don't have to be a, you know, a, a super hacker anymore. You just, oh, I'll just give me that package and boom, I, I can do it. Talk to us about what is, what is this dark web? So the dark web, just like the, the, you know, like the light web, I would call it, right? <laughs> the same web that you go www.whatever to go to Amazon and buy your stuff, you know, adversaries and individuals who want to be able to go buy that ransomware, they can go and buy ransomware as a service. Just like, oh, you have AWS and Azure, where they have all of these web service. There's ransomware as a service that you can go and buy, put in how many targets you need, how many infrastructure you need, and just pay, you know, five, $600 or, or small amount to be able to target an infrastructure, right? So there is that entire on the ground where they have the ability to go and find those services. And it's not just the ones that are really sophisticated because you can have like a script kitty, somebody who's just getting started, who can go to one of those locations. And imagine with the whole introduction of AI, that whole, that just blows everything out. Because now if you're going to say, give me all vulnerability for every Cisco equipment and run some analysis and go buy me a malware that would meet that those requirements, there is an avenue for individuals who want to go to the dark web. And there's a lot of things outside of just malware on the dark web, but the ability to, to do a lot of activities that's supposedly undetectable is there. But we know our agencies are operating there as well, right, to be able to find those people that would try to bring harm to us. Help me understand this again, Dr. Honey. What is the dark web? What, what, how do you get there? I mean, it's just sitting up. Why don't we just shut it down? I mean, what is this thing? <laughs> So just remember, the dark web is now, you know, on the technical side. But remember, we were underground was manual back in the day. It's the same thing. Anything you want, make have your imagination go wild, you can find it on the dark web. I'm not going to give how to get there here. <laughs> I'm not going to give that site how to get there. I've been out there. I've looked around. But... Anything you want, anything that you could find manually back in the day, whatever your imagination is, you can find it on the dark web. So just Scary use stuff. your imagination. <laughs> I'm, not I, I'm already, it, it, it grabbed me. I said, wow, what? you know, the government knows this. Our people know it. Cyber people know it. It's there. But, you know, you can just go there and just really wreak havoc, you know, on, on a business uh, for that. But I'm going to pivot a little bit. Because there's a lot of people out there in our audience that are interested. I just got someone asked me this just the other day. They're interested in um, becoming a cybersecurity professional. Now, it sounds very daunting. You're like, oh, my God, you know, this sounds like a lot. Like, you get, Dr. Honey, you just talked about, it. like, there's not a lot of, you know, of black professionals, you know, in this space. Help us understand how they can get involved in this space and what, is, what does it take to become a cybersecurity uh, professional? So becoming a cybersecurity professional is simple. Just be a professional, right? <laughs> cybersecurity is broad enough that you can bring whatever skills you have into the field. I think that one of the misnomer that we see in the marketplace today is that everybody who does cybersecurity is a hacker. 
There's no such thing. That is not the case because there's multiple people who have additional skills that they can bring to the table that can be successful within the field. I think the, the, the first thing that I would start with is trying to understand what is it that, that, that the individual do on a regular basis? What is it that they want to do within cybersecurity? And NISC has a, a career part that they've established on their website that kind of gives you some of the fields within cybersecurity. Do you want to be a developer? Do you want to do network security? Do you want to do IT security? Do you want to do audit compliance? Do you want to do threat hunting? So there's multiple places to be able to go in. So for example, somebody who's in the help desk may be great as being a part of an inside response, incident response team, right? Because of their kind of cue, being able to hear multiple calls that come in and identify the risk as they come in. So that could be a person who may be able to do it. If you look development, you may be able to go into DevOps. If you like network security, you may be able to enter those same path as well. But I think one of the most successful way within cybersecurity is not only establishing what you want to do, but mentorship, right? There is a, a misnomer that there's millions of empty jobs available. That's not necessarily the case, right? I think one of the challenges that organizations today don't really know what they want, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want the database guy to run network security who's never run into six switch, but he does security, right? So it's, I think when businesses try to understand what is it that they really want, they will find those targets. And what they're trying to do is to have two jobs being operated by one person. And sometimes you're rolling out people so quick that they haven't really spent the time being seasoned, right? Even when you start looking at the recent incident that we have in the exfiltration for that individual who was part of the, the airman, right? Yeah. An individual like that has been in the service for a very short time. You and I would probably never expect he'd be anywhere close to the kind of sensitive information in real life theater that was happening, right? But because of how that structure is set up to be able to do that, the question is whether you have a failure within the, the system itself, or is there a matter of trust, or you have, you have a, a younger population that's entering the field where the social media is a day-to-day -day thing. This is what they grew up on, what they know, but how do you address that as an organization, right? So I think getting in the field is not a difficult task. Um, what has been successful for me has been mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. I have been successful because I've had those who have gone before me who've invested the time in, in me, right? Dr. Um, Fernando Martinez was a, a CISO who took a chance on me when I was getting started, right? He believed in me. I always believed and had the confidence, but he believed in my ability to be successful and invested the time. So just being able to just reach out and have conversation and throughout my career, you know, that's what I've done. I reach out to people who's 10 levels up from me and I'm, I'm the guy who can sit down with a CISO and ask about strategy, but that's just me. Not everybody may be able to do it, but I think kind of establish where that value is. What is it that you're bringing to the table, right? So that a company will be willing to make that investment in you, be a student of cybersecurity. Who are the top 10 people doing stuff within the field, understanding the trends and the market, right? Don't wait for it to come, think ahead, right? So that when it does come, you already have the skills necessary to be successful in that field, right? Interesting. Dr. Tony? So I have a totally different <laughs> story. I have the story of the average folks. You know how, um, you know, a lot of students, they get out of school and they can't find a job. And, they, and how are you going to get a job? Because you don't have the experience and you can't get the experience if you don't have a job. Right. <laughs> okay. That's my journey. <laughs> yeah. Right. I didn't have the easy journey that Dr. Weeks had where he, there were some mentors and that thing, kind of a thing. I struggled. I didn't have a mentor um, people didn't want to mentor, you know, a lot of times, uh, management, they don't want to bring the next person up because they're afraid that you're going to, you know, learn too much and take over their job. So I didn't have people who wanted to mentor me. I didn't have anybody to guide me on the, on the, uh, on the journey. I didn't have professors who say, you know, oh, go take this route or go take that route. It's one of the reasons why I am an adjunct professor and I bring in professionals into my classes, but as guest speakers, because they need to understand how to go from theory and how to put it into practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because reading out the book, so what? Who cares? No one's going to ask you any questions that you read in the book in an interview. They want to know what do you know and how can you can apply it. So I bring guest speakers in to try to help 
um, help some of my students understand how to go from, you know, to, to get into that side. I bring guest speakers in to talk about all the different vast areas of cybersecurity. A lot of people think, like Dr. Weeks was saying, that you have to be technical. You don't. I'm not technical. I started off technical many, many years ago as a developer, but I'm not technical. I like the functional side. I like the policy. I like compliance. I like risk. That's where I fall in. My uh, previous job was, uh, you know, a program manager, project manager. So I like to manage stuff. I like stuff to be in order. I like to make sure things are, you know, methodical. <laughs> so I like that, even from an auditor. How many people have talked about being an internal auditor? No one wakes up and says, hey, I want to go to school and I want to be an auditor. They don't think about that because a lot of times the teachers who are just uh, career academia, they don't know. So you need more people like myself and Dr. Weeks who are in the field on a regular basis to go out and teach and mentor and find those students to, to help them understand the, the opportunities that are out there. The opportunities are endless. So for, for my journey, yeah, I just happened to be maybe seven plus years ago, I was working at a job and just kind of having a conversation with a director who looked like me. And I said, hey, look, I'm trying to figure out what's the next, you know, what's the next big thing? Because I had missed, you know, the, the Microsoft certifications and, yeah. you know, all these other big ones. And so he said, do you like security? I said, sure. Why not? I was already, uh, you know, managing security projects. And he says, well, you know, why don't you do that? And I said, great. How do I get into it? And he says, uh, go join ISACA. ISACA mm -hmm. is a um, information security and audit, audit professional organization that supports this field. And I says, okay, great. What do I do? What do I go find them? And they says, well, there's somebody that's the president currently that looks like you. That was Dr. Weeks. <laughs> and, and that's how I met Dr. Weeks. And he says, oh yeah, come on, get on the board. And I'm like, get on the board. I don't know anything. And he's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just get on the board. And so that's what I did. I hopped on the board. I didn't have any certifications. I didn't have anything. Um, but I hopped on the board, started uh, networking, started um, just you know doing everything that I needed to do. Then there was a program that Dr. Weeks was grabbing people <laughs> to get into. And that was this doctorate program. Here I am. That's how I got into the doctorate program. And so, you know, it's also finding like minded people who who will pull you along and who want to be successful. And so now, you know, we're all we, we, we learned how to work as a team and we stick together, which is how we got to cyber minds. We're all you know, we have that mindset that we want to help others. We want to help the community. We want to help, you know, the next, you know, small business, help them, you know, prevent them from, you know, maybe seeing such a bad breach. Yeah, they're going to see a breach. <laughs> yeah, right. But maybe we can help guide them either before or after. And so, the, you know, the whole point is that everybody's journey is different. Dr. Weeks had a much smoother journey than I did. I had a, a you know a rough journey. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is help people behind me not have such a, a rough journey. But you know there there is no right or wrong reason to how you get there. It's just keep put keep moving forward, keep studying, and keep at it. Oh man, well said, well said, definitely. I'm going to pivot just a little bit because we're going to talk about our we got a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners that are tuning in to our. Um, our session right now. And I know this because this has happened to a business owner in which they had some development done on their site to create some uh, e-commerce uh, opportunities. And the developer had actually wrote in codes that it would autom automate some breaks in, in what they developed so they would then get uh, you know, called in to, to, to fix it, but they already had, you know, created that problem. Talk to us about the, you know, these cyber hacks that, that are happening. And then some of the tools and technologies that especially small business owners, like this is a must have, you must have these kinds of tools. You want to start with that, Dr. Pro Weeks? Sure, definitely. Basics. You got to protect your surface. Virus scans, Windows updates, if you have Windows, Mac updates. You have to stay updated and not expose yourself to vulnerabilities that you could fix. The example you talked about before in terms of that developer developing code, 
there probably was not a code review or solution in place to be able to verify that very code and other types of application may allow you to run through some of those things so you really understand what is being delivered, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to something we, we work with third parties to build stuff and we really don't really know how it works underneath, right? We do an e-commerce, you just, the store need to be up, you need to be able to sell and you don't know stuff is being siphoned off from every transaction. So just being able to do that. I know CISA has a lot of tools that talk about the same thing, right? To be able to address some of those risks. I know the SBA have security awareness and basic training stuff that is available on their website that kind of helps um, organization. And NISC, right, from a standard perspective, the standards may not be applicable to private enterprise, but most people adopt those as part of best practices. You know, being able to do vulnerability scanning. If you have an infrastructure, you need to know what you have. I think the most important step there is, is that data mapping requirement. You gotta know the type of data you have. You also need to know where your data is located, right? And then everything that is within your infrastructure that you have control over, you need to be able to have a solution around it. Um, a lot of it is not, like you said, it's not just technology, it's more security or cybersecurity hygiene, doing basic things. You wouldn't leave your front door open and go on vacation, right? Or you go to bed, you'll make sure your, your, your door is closed, you'll make sure that your treasures are secured, even if somebody was to come in the door, right, from that perspective. So it's just basic things is what, fun, it's just, it's fundamental things is what we're losing individuals and organization on. Because when you look at some of the, the breaches, they're not sophisticated stuff. They stuff because somebody didn't patch a Windows box where there was an update from six months ago. And all of a sudden it's now being exploited because you're not doing those basic security hygiene things that you should be doing as an organization. Right? And it gets more complicated as you go up. But you know, having basic uh, encryption in what you're doing, and it depends whether you're regulated or non-regulated. Right? There is regulation around what is required if you have an incident and the expectation of the board, if you're in healthcare, for example, there is federal requirements around if you have an incident, every incident is reportable, right, to health and human services. But if it's at least 500, then you need to immediately report that. Mm -hmm. If it's less than 500, you still have to report it, but they may give you within that year to be able to upload and track that, right? And just understanding if you're in a non-regulated business, you still need to practice the same. If you, we, we saw an uptick recently where there was a whole stuff around CMMC. We had a lot of organization that was doing business with the federal government about two years back had to go through this whole process of attestation of saying, okay, my security is at least comparable to the organization that for which I'm working with, federal government, DOD, and other type of institution. So there was a big uptick for the last two years of trying to determine what standard this organization should be followed. So now they initially had like four different, five different steps that they went through, and now they've consolidated down to the point now where instead of establishing new frameworks and standards, they're now tying it back into NISC, right? And they outline some of the standards that is expected from organizations that's a part of the federal government. So, and then there's specific toolkits that's there, but you know, those are basic ones that every organization should invest in. If you're not going to invest in that, you're going to have an incident anyway. Wow. Wow, Dr. Honey. I like to piggyback on that and just say, absolutely, everything that Dr. Week said. However, you still have organizations who don't do any of that. You would be surprised at the large name organizations that we all know here on a regular basis whose security is crap. Mm -hmm. And you would be shocked that they don't have the basic things in place that Dr. Weeks and I are talking about, they don't, even though they may be publicly traded and they're supposed to follow certain rules and regulations, you would be shocked that they don't have some of the basic things in place. People think they do because they're a big name and you know we share our information and we just assume, yep, they have all of our information and it's safe, but people would be shocked with some of the large organizational names that we hear every single day that don't have some of the basic things in place. And it goes back to what? Humans are the weakest link. And then also uh, when we're talking about rush to market, 
Agile is one of those words that everybody kind of knows about in the IT world. Agile is how you, um, you know, you're able to, you know, switch on a dime. You're able to deliver some software pretty quickly or deliver a product pretty quickly without having the full product complete. However, back to what Dr. Weeks was saying about uh, code review. Code review hasn't been done in quite some time. I remember code review when when I was a developer, you had to go to your peer and your peer would review your code. And it, it was a whole process before you could release it to production. No one has time for that now. You needed to release it last week. Yeah, even though you just told me today, it should have been released last week. So no one has time for code reviews. The It's the expectation now that you have the ethical and moral obligation that you're going to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Man, so much knowledge, so much information that you're sharing. Because you always hear about these breaches and they, they're they taking your information. They're to either with this credit card information, they've got your medical record information, people are impersonating you. You know, we're talking about that's that identity theft. Talk to us about the effects of identity theft and what can we, if you, somebody does steal your identity is there a way to get, get your identity back yes yeah. so i i think there was an organization where the ceo was posting his social security number on a billboard a couple of years ago right if you remember that that one of those organizations and that was going to provide a million dollars in coverage as it relates to that but i think it's more simpler than that i think one of the first thing that everyone should know is their credit You should definitely know your credit rating. You should definitely know what is on your report. And you should definitely, on at least once a year, get a copy of that. Right? I track mine all the time. So everything that is purchased, I know. If you're concerned about the misuse of that, you can always lock it. Right? So if you need to have your credit run, you need to open it up for a specific period of time, or then you just lock it. I think when you start looking at the whole stuff around identity, I think one of the challenges we have today is around data, not minimization. People are oversharing way too much information on social, an organization that's collecting stuff that is not really required. So you, in, you know, it goes back to your conversation at the, at the onset about being able to protect your data. But I think as an individual, we need to take a, a strategic decision in making sure that how our data is collected, processed, and shared is very appropriately handled, right? Be mindful of where you're sharing that information and with whom it's now being processed. Because your identity is what reflects you, right? I think one of the uptick that I'm seeing in the in the industry today from an identity is where an individual might go to the hospital and impersonate Grant. And imagine if they go to an organization impersonating you with your ID, with their ID, with everything that looked legitimate because they've compromised your identity and now get medical care. Right, and now your medical records now get updated. The next time you go into the, the the hospital, that becomes a challenge, right? They're like, "Hey, I thought we took out your your gallbladder the last time. Why, you know, <laughs> whatever that case." So protecting your identity is very important. So you know, having a shredder, be mindful of what you throw out, right? Any document that is important, shred it before you just throw it in your bag. You know, there's dumpster diving. People may do in your dumpster and pull information that's specific to you. Gonna get a shredder that would be multiple layers. You're gonna have a computer or phone. You know, nowhere, no one throw away hard drives from computers anyway. You're gonna get rid. Of, I got rid of three old laptops this week. I first thing I did was take the hard drive and the memory out of it, right? Mm-hmm. And you're gonna either shred that or you just keep it, right? So that way you don't just say, hey, and as an old computer, let me just throw it out. All that data walk to walk to the door. Many organizations don't do that. In some of the organization that I worked at before, when they get rid of all asset, there's a shredding company, shredded comes, and they shred the hard drive for anything that may be you know, still left there. So it's the same thing, just like where you protect your information, protect your family information. Don't just share everything on the other place. You go to some organization, they may ask for your full demographic information, full social security. My question is, do you need it? Can you just use the last four, yeah. right? And just question those things. We've always talked about the issue of going to the store and they're asking for your zip code when you use your credit card. I think we're so ingrained now, we automatically assume that is part of the purchasing process. But it's not part of the purchasing process. That's just another key identifier that they can use to associate this card with Grant McGon, right? So now you go to Target, 
you have the same ID, whether you purchase in Texas, New York, California, or Florida. Well, we are getting to the end of our session. Sure. And, um, and, and before we do, we got about a minute. Dr. Dr. Honey, did you want to chime in on what we just talked about on identity theft? I was just going to say real quickly, just, just keep your credit report locked at all times. If you're not going to buy something on purpose, then it should not be open. You need to purposely have to go unlock your your uh, credit report when you want to buy something, because, yeah, it's easy. I mean, uh, you know, I can look on any social media and I can watch what somebody is advertising and watch what they're doing. And I can I can just listen to a couple of bit of information and I can go find out who they are, where they live and everything about them. That's if I want to spend that much time. And it's not that difficult, but I just don't have the time or care to sit there and listen. But it's easy to to do so just think about somebody who actually wants to do it so if you keep at least your credit report locked and back back to what dr week said pay attention to what you say on social media pay attention to what you share i don't give my uh zip code out when i'm at the stores like and if they insist i give them some fake zip code there you go so while we wrap up just real quick because i know people want to get in touch with you especially some students people that are interested in cybersecurity. what is the best way to get in touch with both of you so mine is thoney at cyberminesinstitute.org. Um, Dr. Weeks, you want to give out the distribution list? that will get to all of us. Yeah, so we have careers at um, cybermindinstitute.org for individuals who want to be able to, to come and work with us. We're on LinkedIn, both of us on LinkedIn, Alexis Pedro, Dr. Alexis Pedro Weeks. Um, you'll find me on the Privacy Doc um, and Tina as well. And we're always happy to work with organizations who's looking to, you know, to better themselves. And hopefully we can be able to bring some of our experience and our expertise to, to help them. Oh, wow. This has been great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for being on the Black Business Olympics. You are part of Team Five Star and you That's did great. a five star performance today. So genius is common and we'll see both of you on the other side.